lovely to see all of you in the uh, heart of the cyber military industrial complex. Um, like John said, I am Andy Greenberg, and I am a writer for Wired Magazine, and I've written this book, Sandworm, which I, I hope will be seen as a kind of definitive account of the first ever full-blown cyber war. Uh, it's a little strange to be telling this story to you guys, this audience of actual cyber war experts, a very unique audience, and uh, usually it goes the other way. I'm a journalist, I call you guys to tell me the story. Uh, so this is not a technical talk, as, as John said. It, uh, I hope it's not just the warm-up act, but it's, it, it is a story about human experiences of cyber war, a collection of human stories that I uh, put together over the last three years of working on this book. And uh, they, they start, in some sense, or rather one at least, is captured in this video. Uh, whoa. Here we go. So this is uh, an HMI, as you guys probably know, at a, at a, it was actually inside of a Western Ukrainian electric utility. And the mouse on this screen is clicking on circuit breakers and trying to open them, which would turn off the power to civilians in Western Ukraine. And here the operator inside this control room pulls back his iPhone, which he's using to record this, and he shows that nobody was touching the mouse. And yet the mouse cursor continues to move continues to try to open those circuit breakers. Uh, this is what we call a phantom mouse attack. Uh, the hackers had taken over the Citrix remote desktop machine and um, re remote desktop software and locked the oper operators out and forced them to watch as they turned off the power to a quarter million Ukrainian civilians, the first ever blackout triggered by hackers. Uh, that is in some ways the beginning of this story. I, uh, was asked in late 2016 by my editors at Wired to find the big story of cyber war. And I think what they had on their minds was the, were the attacks on the US election that year by Russian hackers. I didn't see that as cyber war at all. So I, I you know, was kind of resistant. I wasn't even sure if I knew that uh, cyber war had really happened. Um, so I, I was aware that my colleague Kim Zetter, who had left Wired by then, before, uh, when she was at Wired, she'd written this incredible story about that first blackout attack. So I began looking deeper in Ukraine, where there had been in early 2014 a pro-Western revolution that had prompted a, an invasion from Russia, and that physical invasion had been accompanied with uh, just wave after wave of cyber attacks. It turns out on not just the utilities, but also uh, the media and private industry and government agencies. And this, I could see once I was looking deeper and talking to Ukrainians that this was a kind of actual cyber war in progress. And just as I was reading about this and, and getting into it, it happened again. Uh, there was a second blackout in late 2016. So I was late to this story. This was in late 2016, I was just getting into it, but I could see that there was an actual cyber war happening in Ukraine. These kind of uh, quintessential acts of a nation state disruptive attack on a, their adversary in the midst of a kinetic war, it ticked all those boxes. But I wanted to tell this story in a, in a different way from the way that these stories have been told before. I wanted to try to tell it like good war journalism where you capture the experiences of the combatants and the victims of these attacks and the people caught in the crossfire. So I, I went to Ukraine and one of the first people I met was Alexei Yasinski, who had been the chief information security officer at Starlight Media, uh, Ukraine's biggest TV, TV broadcaster. And Starlight Media had come under attack from this group that would come to be known as Sandworm. They were, in fact, the very first victim of that first wave of data destructive attacks in late 2015. And Alexei had done the incident response on this attack, which was designed to destroy their entire network, more or less. Um, then he'd taken that experience and gone to this little security firm, ISSP, and made it into the go-to incident responder for wave after wave of these attacks by Sandworm, uh, until finally, in late 2016, uh, he was sitting down to watch a movie with his family. Snowden, in fact, was the movie. And uh, an hour into the movie, the power was turned out to his home. And this blackout happened at exactly the stroke of midnight, uh, just a, a week off from the anniversary of that first blackout attack. And he sensed immediately that these hackers that he had been tracking kind of in this technical space for a year at that point had reached out from that technical research world into his personal space uh, he felt very violated by this. He felt it very personally that 
they had reached into his home. And I met with the operators at Prekarpatia Oblonergo, that Western Ukrainian facility, who um, in this incredibly refreshing way, and this is something I really appreciate about Ukrainians, uh, unlike practically any other victims of cyber attacks anywhere in the world, they were incredibly open about sharing everything they were experiencing. So not only were they you know, the victims of these terrible, unprecedented attacks, but they also wanted to get the word out. They were tired of the world ignoring the cyber war that was unfolding, the way that Russia was abusing them, both in a physical and digital war. And uh, these guys in this control room had undergone a really relentless and brutal attack that had not only locked them out with that phantom mouse attack and opened the circuit breakers, turning off the power, but it also turned off the backup power to their control room, throwing them into a blackout. The hackers had rewritten the, serial, the firmware of the serial to ethernet converters in their distribution stations, locking them out from remotely turning the power back on. They, they used kill disk, this wiper, to destroy all of the computers in the facility, and then finally bombarded them with this telephone DDoS attack and this kind of last insult to injury. And they shared all of this with me incredibly candidly. Uh, and I met with this guy, Oleg Zaychenko, who was the operator on duty in late 2016, a week before Christmas, at uh, the Ukrainergo, the National Utility Transmission Station in northern Kiev. He was sitting at this desk a week before Christmas, just before midnight, when uh, an alarm went off above his head, this ringing bell, and he looked to his right at the control panel and saw that a uh, light there had turned from red to green, which signals that a circuit breaker had been opened. And as he reached for the phone to call his supervisor, he just watched as every other light on that control panel flipped from red to green in rapid, rapid succession, uh, turning off the power to a fraction of the, of the capital of the country. Seychenko and Ukrainergo could not really tell me the mechanics of this attack at the time, but they said that it was automated, that it was actually kind of the opposite of the 2015 manual clicking through those circuit breakers. And uh, that, I didn't really know what that meant until ESET, a few months later, uh, revealed that a piece of malware had been used in this attack that they call in destroyer, which could speak directly to those circuit breakers, sending commands in any of four protocols to those actual pieces of physical equipment. And uh, this was a, a, a moment when I could see that these attacks were not only escalating, but there was kind of innovation happening. The, uh, the mystery at the time was why that attack only led to a one-hour blackout. That's how, how long it took for the operators to turn the power back on. And that mystery was only solved in recent months by Joe Slowick at Dragos, who pieced together a new reconstruction of the order of operations of that attack and showed that turning off the power was just the first step, that um, there was this little understood component that also would denial of service protective relays, the safety devices in that transmission station, so that when the operators scrambled to turn the power back on uh, as quickly as they could to re-energize all of these circuit breakers, they would themselves, the Ukrainergo staff, cause an event that might have burned lines or blown up a transformer, uh, the kind of destructive attack on a power grid that we've never seen before, that we've always dreaded, that would have led to a blackout far longer than anything we actually saw. This only failed because of a uh, little configuration error in their malware. Uh, so at this point, I could see that yes, there was uh, a kind of escalating cyber war happening here, that uh, in fact, there was experimentation happening. And I wrote this story for Wired about that idea, um, trying not just to capture the human experiences of this cyber war, but also to, with this kind of underlying thesis that what happens in Ukraine um, will soon happen to the rest of us too because Russia is using it as a test lab for cyber war and that cyber war will sooner or later spill out to the West. And when you make a uh, prediction like this, you don't really want it to come true the, uh, the very week that you print it, but that is essentially what happened uh, the day that this story hit newsstands, in fact, uh, we began to see this screen on computers around the world. This of course is not Petya, and it looked like a ransomware worm. I thought it was a ransomware worm myself. I was confused, despite having just gotten back from Ukraine only a couple of months earlier. I still thought this was somehow a piece of uh, kind of cyber criminal malware at first. And it was only when I called up my 
Ukrainian sources that they saw it for what it was. I mean, Ukrainians are always willing to say, this is Russia that did this to us. And in this case, they were right. Um, uh, and very quickly, this, this worm, which you could not actually pay the ransom for, it was just a destructive worm pretending to be ransomware, took down 300 Ukrainian companies and 22 banks, four hospitals that I'm aware of, uh, multiple airports, pretty much every government agency in Ukraine. It was a kind of carpet bombing of the Ukrainian internet, but, if, but it did immediately spread to the rest of the world, fulfilling this prediction um, far more quickly than I would have ever wanted it to. And uh, we began to hear these numbers reported by public companies to their shareholders. It's kind of staggering um, numbers here. $400 million from FedEx, $300 million from Maersk, the world's largest shipping firm, $870 million eventually from Merck. Uh, I had never seen these kinds of damages reported from a cyber attack before. And the crazy thing was that very quickly after this attack, um, those Ukrainian you know, suspicions that this was an act of cyber war, that it was Russia, that it was in fact the same group, Sandworm, that had been carrying out those blackouts, was uh, essentially confirmed by ESET. Uh, ESET, again, pulled together a lot of uh, forensic data to show that NotPetya was uh, an act of this group that they call Telebots, which I call, uh, many others call Sandworm. And yet, I felt like uh, I was being gaslit almost because none of these companies would talk about their experience of this. None of them would say that it was Russia that did this attack or uh, that, it, you know, in fact, no governments in the West were willing to call out NotPetya as this Russian cyber attack with truly staggering consequences. Uh, it kind of made sense in a way that the West had ignored this Ukrainian cyber war uh, up till that point. You know, in this very callous way, we treated what was happening in, U in Ukraine uh, even as these hackers crossed every red line we've ever tried to set as they did these quintessential acts of cyber war, turning off the power to civilians. We treated that as somebody else's problem because Ukraine is not us and Ukraine is not even NATO. But now this cyber attack in Ukraine had spilled out to the West and hit American soil. I mean, Merck is based in New Jersey and yet still there was total silence around this. Some kind of weird uh, sweeping under the rug of this attack is what it felt like. So I went back to you know, the place where I knew people would talk about it. And I did a kind of oral history of Ukraine's experience of NotPetya. I went back to Ukraine and I met with, uh, for instance, this guy, Volodymyr Omelyan, the Minister of Infrastructure of Ukraine. And he, in this just uh, refreshingly, delightfully candid way, just told me that NotPetya destroyed their entire government, that the government was dead on that day of June 27th, 2017. Every government agency had been taken down. It was, as he said, a massive bombing of all of their systems. I met with this guy, the, uh, the head of the Ukrainian Postal Service, who described this kind of um, heart-rending decision to turn off the network of this nat national service that is responsible not just for mail in Ukraine, but newspaper subscriptions and payments, and even the distribution of pensions to retirees in the country, which is a really vital service in a post-Soviet country. And then I met with this guy, Pavlo Bondarenko, who was an IT staffer at the Ministry of Health and had also made the decision, in fact, advised the health minister early in the day to turn off their network to spare it from NotPetya. Uh, the Postal Service was too late. They lost 70% of their computers. But Pavlo, by suggesting this, I, I believe saved a lot of their important data. Uh, but then he described to me how he left the office at the end of the day after this, this kind of panicked day of fighting off NotPetya and tried to get on the subway, found that his, his credit card wouldn't swipe him into the Kiev metro. And, uh, and so he had to get a physical token to take the metro and he needed to get cash. So uh, th that, in fact, because the, the credit card system on the metro had been taken down by NotPetya. So he went out to find cash. Every ATM in this neighborhood had been taken down by NotPetya too. So he finally found one ATM still working with a tiny cash limit, a long line, like in Soviet times. And he waited in line, got a small amount of cash, bought a physical token, got on the subway, went to his home neighborhood, tried to buy some groceries, found that the payment system was taken down in his grocery store, 
had to go back out to find another ATM. And again, in this neighborhood, all the ATMs were taken down. And he began to feel, as he described it to me, like he was in some kind of end of the world movie. He felt, that, he felt this in this almost visceral sense. He actually literally said to me that it was like he was missing a limb, like he, his way of interacting with the world had just broken. And I met with Alessia Linick on the right here. Um, she is the CEO of a company called Linkos Group. Um, and this is her father on the left who founded that company. And uh, Linkos Group, you guys may know, sells a piece of accounting software called Medoc, which was used as the carrier for NotPetya. Uh, Sandworm essentially hijacked the updates of Medoc to seed out its malware, this worm, to every, every, every user of that software who became every victim of NotPetya. Um, and Linkos Group has been blamed in part for NotPetya because of their lack of security that prevented, you know, that could have prevented that, that supply chain attack. But they were also a victim. Uh, they ironically were hit with NotPetya, of course. Their entire network was destroyed. But so was their reputation by this attack. And uh, you know, this company that they had, a family business that they had built from scratch. And then a week later, uh, at their kind of headquarters on the outskirts of Kiev, vans full of Ukrainian police arrived and poured out and like this kind of SWAT team that ran up the stairs, um, pointing semi-automatic rifles at people, kicking down a door uh, as if they're raiding the Bin Laden compounds and grabbing a, the update server um, as if somehow that was the source of the attack. And to me it was, it was uh, sad, but also this almost comic illustration of the ways that we misunderstand cyber war, that like we humans still have this intuition that we can trace uh, that this, this act to its source and uh, as if somehow this was the source of the attack. It's a kind of misunderstanding of the geography of this attack, which was actually carried out by hackers thousands of miles away. As, as I was piecing together this kind of oral history of not practice effects in Ukraine, I was also really banging my head against the wall trying to get any of those multinational companies to tell their story of how they were victimized by this. And uh, I finally, thanks to a few very brave sources, uh, one of those companies was able to piece together the experience of Maersk, the world's larger shipping firm. And uh, Maersk had one installation of this Medoc accounting software in one office in Odessa on the Black Sea coast of Ukraine. And that was enough for their entire global network to be uh, taken down by NotPetya, encrypted essentially, and uh, unrecoverable. So uh, what that felt like, according to one IT staffer, in their, uh, this is their kind of beautiful Copenhagen headquarters on the harbor, which they never let me inside of, by the way, I took this um, with my iPhone from the outside. Um, one IT staffer on this kind of campus described uh, seeing his screen go black on that uh, afternoon of June 27, 2017 and then looking around to see if anybody else knew what was going on, and he saw a wave of black screens go around the room, just black, 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 as NotPetya took down every, every computer in their global network. And soon people were running down hallways, screaming to each other to turn off their machines to spare them from this worm. They were running into conference rooms, unplugging computers without warning. Uh, people were vaulting over the turnstiles, the physical security turnstiles, in the building because they were trying to reach other parts of the, the headquarters to warn people and even the physical security elements of the building had been paralyzed by this. But of course Maersk does not just have you know, uh, computers as, they're they not just an IT firm. They also control uh, 76 terminals in ports around the world, a kind of massive global machine responsible for a fifth of the world's total shipping capacity. This is the terminal at Newark, uh, which I chose to focus on in part just because I can see it from my, the window of my office. And um, this is a facility, a full square mile in size, where cargo ships the size of the Empire State Building arrive, carrying another Empire State Building size load of containers on them. And on this day, suddenly nobody knew what was on those ships. Their inventory system had been entirely wiped. Nobody could figure out how to perform this gargantuan Jenga game of, of unloading those containers. And meanwhile, at the gates outside of this terminal, uh, trucks were beginning to line up by the hundreds 
this gate, the gate outside has a voice over IP system where trucks pull up and are told you know, where to check in, to drop something off or pick it up. And on this day, that, that system was dead. The gate was locked. Nobody could even tell these poor truck drivers what was happening. Uh, Mayors couldn't even send an email to them. And this line was stretching miles long until finally those truck drivers were just told by the port police, you gotta get out of here. You gotta find somewhere else to send your whatever, diapers, avocados, uh, components of just-in-time supply chains, perishable goods. And they all had to find some other line to, to ship their stuff at a premium or somewhere to store it. Sometimes it had to be refrigerated. This was a fiasco, and it wasn't just happening in Newark. It was happening at 17 of Maersk's terminals around the world. If you, you have to multiply that kind of fiasco to this global scale from Los Angeles to Newark to Spain to Rotterdam to uh, Mumbai, this was being repeated. And Maersk quickly uh, began this recovery operation. They set up this building in um, Maidenhead, the town outside of London, and made it their kind of crisis center. They told everybody who even vaguely worked in IT to just fly there immediately, and hired Deloitte, paid them millions of dollars to put hundreds of consultants into this building to just do whatever they could to make this problem go away. People were sleeping under desks and in conference rooms, working 24 seven, but they very quickly discovered that they had a really serious problem, which is that they did not have a backup of their domain controllers, a single backup. Maersk has more than 100 domain controllers around the world, um, and they were designed to, up to uh, back up rather to each other in this redundancy system. Um, so if you lose one, that's fine. If you lose 25, even that's fine. You still have plenty of, of backups. But you, they had not planned for a situation where every single one of those domain controllers around the world is wiped simultaneously, which is exactly what NotPetya did. So uh, they began this kind of panicked process. They, they had to get that backup to even start the process of rebuilding their network, really. So they began calling every data center they had in the world. Um, and then in this kind of IT miracle, they found that there was one backup in Ghana because in that one Ghanaian data center, um, there had been a blackout, not a, not a hacker-induced blackout, just a normal blackout. And very fortunately, that blackout had left that domain controller offline at the moment NotPetya hit, which preserved its data. So they had to get that backup from Ghana to Maidenhead. But they tried to set up a kind of secure connection. The bandwidth wasn't enough from uh, Ghana to London. So they tried to fly the Ghanaians to London, but they didn't have the right visas. So they had to do this kind of insane relay race where they flew the Ghanaians to Nigeria. They flew somebody from London to Nigeria. They did this uh, handoff in the airport of a thumb drive that had that backup, flew it back to London, drove it to Maidenhead, and began this still weeks-long process of rebuilding 45,000 PCs and 7,000 servers. It would take Maersk uh, two months to finally wrap up this recovery process and get back to normalcy. Now, that's, that is the experience of Maersk. That's how you lose $300 million to a cyber attack. Um, but now you have to imagine that this happened to every one of those victims on that list. Uh, in fact, it was far worse. Merck lost more than twice as much. FedEx, Mondelez, which owns Nabisco and Cadbury, and uh, Rankin Benkisser, which owns, you know, which makes Durex condoms and Tylenol. Each one of these companies uh, had their own story of a fiasco like this. And that is how you lose $10 billion to a global cyber attack, which is the number that the White House put out that I, when I confirmed this with Tom Bossert, the senior cybersecurity official in the White House at the time, he made clear that this was just a minimum. This is the floor for the estimate of NotPetya's damages, not the ceiling. And even this number does not capture the full toll of NotPetya because in this kind of underreported aspect of this calamity, uh, NotPetya hit hospitals too. Not just in Ukraine either, but in the United States. This is a Facebook post from a woman who uh, in Pennsylvania was going in for bladder surgery on June 27, 2017. And she describes how Europe or somewhere in that vicinity hacked into Beaver Medical Hospital or the hospital she was going into, shut down all their computer systems. It happened just as she was getting into the operating room. And she says no computers were used in her operation, so it went forward. But she saw other people around her have their operations canceled and delayed. 
This was a pretty rare experience. There were not many hospitals in the US that I know of that were directly hit by NotPetya, but far more common was that they were indirectly hit through the outage of this company, Nuance. Uh, Nuance uh, makes speech-to-text recognition software. They were badly hit by NotPetya. They lost $92 million themselves. But more importantly, um, Nuance's software is used to transcribe medical records in hospitals across the US. And uh, I spoke with the chief information security officer of Sutter Health, this network of 24 hospitals uh, around the US. And she, uh, Jackie Monson is the chief information security officer. She told me how on that day, uh, she was the first relieved that they had not been infected by NotPetya, but then very quickly, within 24 hours, began to see that there was a different, subtler problem, which is that nu the nuance outage meant that they had a backlog of more than a million changes to medical records that had been lost. This was a silent failure. Doctors had been reading changes into Nuance's service um, that had not turned into transcriptions, that had not been turned into changes to medical records. And what that meant uh, on the grounds, I mean, first I should say that Jackie at one point was on a conference call with Nuance and a bunch of other hospitals that had more than 200 participants trying to get answers about this outage. So it seems like there were dozens or maybe hundreds of hospitals affected this way. And what that looked like on the grounds for one IT staffer, sorry, uh, is that she, another woman in a, in a major American hospital, describes how a panicked nurse came up to her a few days after Napetia and uh, told her that they had a child patient who was due for a transfer to another hospital for a critical medical procedure. And this child, uh, had, they didn't know if the child had had the tests necessary to clear them for that. that it, to, to make sure that that procedure would be safe because the medical record was missing updates. And this IT staffer had to hunt through all of the raw audio files that the doctors had recorded but that hadn't been trans transcribed, find the one that was necessary to update the medical record, make that update, and they did this just in time with hours to spare before that child's transfer. Then this happened three more times, just to that one IT staffer in the week after Napetia. Uh, they did catch all of those changes in time. Uh, none of these patients actually missed their procedures. But that IT staffer at this major American hospital was haunted by this. She told me that, yes, they had caught the, you know, their patients' changes, but if you multiply this by the hundreds or thousands of patients at each of these hospitals, across dozens or hundreds of hospitals in the US, she still worries and cannot say with certainty that NotPetya did not harm someone's actual health or life. And we don't know if NotPetya was the first attack that cost someone their life, but that fact may have just been obscured by its sheer scale. In February of 2018, uh, the White House finally put out this statement, maybe the shortest statement I've ever seen from a government agency, and it said simply, NotPetya was uh, the Russian military. Uh, it was the worst cyber attack in history and there will be consequences. This, was, this attribution was backed up with all the other five eyes. And then a month later, the, the US government did institute new sanctions uh, on Russia in response to Nampetya. Maybe not enough, maybe too little, definitely too late. This came nine months after Nampetya hit. And more importantly, it came more than two and a half years after this cyber war began in Ukraine. A cyber war that very clearly, to anyone who was looking at it, was crossing every red line we've ever tried to set for um, cyber attacks on civilian inf critical infrastructure. We talked for years and years about what happens when, the, when hackers attack the power grid. And then when it finally happened, nobody said anything. We treated it as somebody else's problem. We treated it as, as uh, something that Russia could just do with impunity. Um, in the kind of third act of my book, I, I do try to get to the bottom of who Sandworm is. John only gave me half an hour here, so I can't uh, tell the full detective story of, of uh, how, by following the, the great detective work of people like Kaspersky and FireEye and ultimately the FBI and the Mueller investigation, um, you know, I, I and those researchers 
and law enforcement did try to uh, and ultimately hold accountable some actual human beings for these attacks and, and with details as specific as their names and faces in the building that they work in. But um, in some ways, this is not a story, as John was kind of hinting at, about the perpetrators of this attack. It's a story about the victims, best told by the victims. And in the story and history of Ukraine, this country whose very name means borderland, it has always been caught between West and East. Um, it has been this victim of its geography. It's been invaded by the Mongols, and then the Turks, and then the Tatars, and then the Nazis, and then the Soviets. It was massacred in the Holocaust. It was starved in the Holodomor, this man-made Soviet famine in the 1930s. It has always been this victim of its placement in, in the world, of its geography, of being on the doorstep of its adversary. But we, historically, have always watched those conflicts from afar, uh, treated them as a faraway foreign conflict. And now, in this new domain, we thought we, uh, this new domain of cyber war, we thought that we could uh, still watch those, that invasion happen with impunity. But we are in an era where war plays by different physics, different geography, different rules. And that war did spill out to hit us as well, because we are connected. We are at the doorstep of our adversary, too. Uh, I was reminded of what Michael Hayden, the former director of the NSA, um, said in 2010 at Black Hat, which is that on the internet, we are all Polands, that the geography of this domain plays to the offense. And I think he meant that in a very simple sense, that cyber war is too easy, just like it's too easy to invade Poland, maybe. Uh, and uh, that the attacker has the advantage. But I think that there's a deeper meaning here. Um, he was actually off by just a few hundred miles that on the internet, we are all Ukraine. And if we continue to ignore the lessons of this borderland, then we will learn them ourselves through our own painful experience. Thanks. <laughs>